Awesome. So uh, my name is Riley Mattingly, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oklahoma. Um, for the past year, I've been uh, playing in RF NOC, um, developing a uh, fast spectrum sensing block. Uh, really uh, started last year with the uh, UHD 4.0 RF NOC workshop. So, uh, you know, this is kind of building on that, some things that uh, I ran into and some uh, uh, kind of some ways I uh, found my way around. around. So uh, I encourage you uh, to look at that workshop. It was really helpful. And uh, hopefully this design flow that we've put together uh, will also be helpful. Uh, so a quick overview, overview, we'll just look at um, an overview of RF knock and fast spectrum sensing uh, before moving into kind of a design flow that we, we found uh, for developing a block and, and for an architecture that we use to actually implement uh, spectrum sensing. Uh, so jumping right in, uh, RF NOC is uh, a framework that runs on the FPGA in um, USR, EDIS USRP radios uh, and um, on devices like the X310 there is additional uh, FPGA floor space available and we can utilize RF NOC to put our own signal processing blocks on the FPGA inside of this uh, network uh, architecture. Um, so if we deploy our processing algorithms to FPGA, we can really take advantage of um, um, parallelism to get increased performance, as well as custom state machines and application-specific pipelines. So kind of offloading that off of the CPU. Uh, additionally, if you have a critical path um, that is well-suited for FPGA, you can remove the host PC um, completely uh, out of the loop. So maybe, you know, we have a spectrum sensing block that determines um, where the available spectrum is, and then we can um, actually use a on-device FPGA block to generate um, that signal. So we can keep that all closed loop, uh, just jumping from uh, knock block to knock block. Um, so what is fast spectrum sensing? Um, well, in this iteration, we use a, a static threshold that was developed from a priori, a priori knowledge of the uh, spectrum. And then, um, you know, we take a, a, a frequency snapshot and then we assign each frequency bin as either high power or low power um, based on that uh, threshold. Um, now for um, the narrow low, free, uh, low power bins, we wanna reiterate through this, um, this spectral frame and um, merge the, high, the closely spaced high power bins together. Our um, solution set is actually the set of uh, low power bins, and this can go on and be further processed with some other um, multi-weight optimization. And so uh, go ahead and going ahead and getting rid of those very narrow band, uh, low power bands, kind of saves some, some processing later on. So we, we know what we're trying to do uh, in the FPGA, but before we can really develop an FPGA block, we need to know what the data flow looks like and what the interfaces are like. And so uh, RF NOC uses a, a cheddar packet as kind of the basic um, data packet. It stands for Compressed Hierarchical Datagram for RF NOC. Um, and the Cheddar infrastructure is, can actually be variable width. Um, by default, it's 64 bits, and, and we found that to be suitable. But it has, each packet is uh, going to have, you know, a header word uh, that gives you information about the packet. It has an optional timestamp field, and then can have some optional user-defined metadata words before finally having at least one data word uh, in each packet. If, if there's no data, there's no need for a packet. So you have to have um, some data words. There are two communication planes in RF NOC. There's a, there's a data plane and a control plane. Um, the control packets are also uh, listed as Cheddar. They have a, you know, a slightly different header format, and, and uh, as you would expect, um, the control and data planes are kept completely separate in the framework, and uh, they're optional for each block that you use. One can have you know, control or not. Um, so we actually don't uh, discuss much about the control uh, plane uh, as we didn't really take advantage of that. Um, so cheddar packets are moved through the FPGA using an Axi stream protocol. This was uh, really standardized by uh, Xilinx, all of their uh, most of their IP blocks um, use this, this AXI stream protocol so that you can 
and interface directly with them. In fact, uh, the FPGA block that's provided there, it, it kind of takes, or the FFT block rather, that's provided um, with the framework actually takes advantage of this and you see the, the Axie stream being piped into the, the FFT IP block. Um, so this stream has a few signals of interest. We have our data line that is um, where our, our data is coming in off the bus. That's our data bus. We have a valid bit that tells us if the current word is valid or not. Um, a ready bit, which is actually the recipient block telling uh, the transmission block that it's ready to receive data. And then a T last to indicate the last word in, uh, the last word in a packet. Uh, there's an additional signal called T user that's not used in the, in the base. Um, uh, the base stream, but this tells you, this describes what kind of word is on the bus, and this will be important later. Um, so we actually need to frame and deframe our packets off of this uh, main Axie bus, and there are two interfaces for doing that. So first we have the Axie stream data bus, or interface, which allows us to take in the data on an Axie stream. So this has all the signals we talked about before, um, without T-user, all of it's going to be your data words. And the other important header information is piped into the block um, using st static signals. Um, so you have the timestamp, the length of the packet, uh, a bit to indicate if it's the end of a vector, and a bit to indicate if it's an end of a burst. Um, we found uh, this can get a little bit complicated, especially if you're trying to change these values as headers go out, where you know, so that timing can be... Um, it's not ambiguous, but it can be hard to keep track of. And so if you really want control over those, that header information, um, there is another interface, which is the Axie Stream payload context. And this gives us two Axie Streams coming in. One is, um, has all of our context information. So this is the header, timestamp, um, I suppose metadata if you would like. And, um, and then a payload, which has your data. Now, these are linked in time, and you can do, um, they support various things like prefetching of the header and timestamp. Um, so there is a, a little bit more to manage, but this really gives you great control over all of the data fields um, that you may need. So we've defined um, the interfaces, and we actually use that um, uh, payload context interface. So now let's define the architecture for our block. So the FSS algorithm can provide a reference to all of the low power bands in a specific frequency frame. Um, and merging is critical to provide that full set while also not bogging down any other, any later optimizations. Um, but we actually wanna go ahead and optimize for the greedy case, which gives us the widest continuous open spectrum. And uh, this also allows us to get rid of the, the merging um, because if you, if you would merge away that specific solution band, um, then it's obviously not the largest or you hope anyway. Um, and so you can use that merge distance as a parameter to say, if that is your largest, then there's just simply no open spectrum. Um, so what are some of the goals that we wanna hit while designing this block? Well, we want an uninterrupted data stream through the block. Um, there's really no reason why we should cache any of the data. Um, so, so we really don't want to halt the stream. We want to tie the input and the output right together and just let it run straight through. Um, but then how do we send information to the next block about our results? Well, if we had cached the data, we could maybe insert some metadata into the next block that the next block could pull off and, and use. Um, but we actually, again, we didn't want to stop the data to, to facilitate that. And so we just went ahead for a full secondary port. And this actually on the block, which actually gives us, uh, um, we can actually do whatever we want with this data now. We can pipe that uh, straight out um, in GNU Radio. We can put it, drop it straight into a file sync and save all the data we want. So that really leaves us unconstrained. Well, since we're going out of another port, we're going to need... Um, more than just our basic FSS state machine. Um, we're gonna need a send state machine to generate the header data and um, facilitate sending it out that secondary port. Um, so as far as the FSS state machine goes, um, we wanna represent our low power bands in buckets and each bucket needs a bin and a size, or a start bin and a size and uh, so when we encounter our first low power bin, we can create one of these buckets. 
and we can count for every consecutive low power bend what our size of that bucket is going to be. When we finally get to, when we finally encounter another high power bend or the end of the frame, um, we can freeze that bucket. But if we're only looking for the largest bucket, when, then we don't need to generate what could become many buckets for each frame. We only need two buckets. So it's whatever our previous was, bucket was, whatever our, the bucket we're currently writing into is, and then when we encounter another low power band, we can just overwrite whichever bucket is the smallest. So then our final structures that we need to facilitate all this is a counter to track um, which bin we are in the frame, and then um, pairs of registers to represent our buckets. And then finally, a third bucket is used just to hold our send information. This way, when we encounter our T last and we take that into account uh, to make our uh, final decisions on buckets, we can take our largest bucket and send that on so that our FSS state machine isn't waiting on the send state machine to complete before it, uh, before it can take on the next packet. So uh, here's our FSS state machine uh, in all of its glory. Again, we, we start in that search, uh, func that search uh, state. And then when we encounter a, a low power bin, we um, look at the sizes. Um, and then we move into whichever state to fill the bucket for the smallest size. If both are zero, then we just go into fill bucket one. We stay there and we count um, the low power bins until we encounter a high power bin, in which case uh, we go back to search, or if it's T last, then we, we do our resets and we, we, copy our, um, we copy our largest bin to our sin bucket and uh, uh, reset the state machine. Uh, the SIN state uh, is much simpler. Uh, we have our SIN flag that we can assert when we, when we encounter T last, and then we can uh, send our header out, wait for context T ready to go high to indicate that um, the recipient block did consume, was ready to consume that um, word before moving on to our SIN data. And we send that as either, uh, we send those two data words along and then we do our cleanup. So we set our send flag low and we reset our bus and, and wait for uh, the next packet to complete. So um, now that we have uh, defined our state machines and we have taken the uh, hours, days, or weeks to uh, get that all nice and uh, tested in, in Verilog as its own module, um, we can actually generate um, the RF knocked Verilog um, to uh, actually accept our, our module. So uh, to create a block, um, we can use the RF knock mod tool, and we can use the new mod command to set up a, a module that can contain contain our blocks. This creates a, a directory, and there's you know a bunch of uh, bunch of files inside, and it gets our file structure all set up. And then from inside that directory, we can add our new block. Um, and uh, we, uh, other than the name, we just use the, the defaults for all of those options. Um, there, there are six main files that we, we had to, to, uh, to get a, our, a block with uh, that's, I wouldn't say complex, but has a, has a few things in it. So we have our two Verilog files. Um, our our knock shell um, block name dot v file actually uh, we we don't need anything in there. That's where our uh, interface comes from. But our rf knock block block name dot v file that's where our module is going to be instantiated, and and there's the location of of that. Um, our image core dot yaml um, that is actually where we can instantiate a, a, a bunch of uh, all of our blocks that, that we need in our image and, and synthesize those to to the x310. And then we have our implementation.cpp file. Um, this is where we can add other registers, add our other port on the software side, tell the software about that. And then we have our block name.yaml, which describes the block that we're designing. And then um, a dot block.yaml, which is used by GNU Radio to, to show what that looks like uh, in the GUI. So first, let's start by defining our, our, block, uh, our block parameters in our block name.yaml file that's generated by a mod tool. Um, the first section is the clocks. Um, these, should be, um, these should be ready to go just as they are. I will caution you. Um, I accidentally uh, deleted something here or in the connections, and 
Uh, debugging a, a random signal being used as your clock is not the most fun thing in the world. Uh, so pay special attention there to that CE clock. Um, and then we have our, where we define our data ports. You can see here our FPGA interface is AXI payload context, and there are some associated um, parameters that need to be defined specifically for that interface. Uh, for the other interfaces, I encourage you to look at the RFNOC specification to see what those are. Um, we're just using the defaults here and they seem to work great. Okay, so we've, we've generated, we've kind of outlined what our file's supposed to look like, or what our block's supposed to look like, and now uh, we want to generate, um, we want to regenerate those .v files so that, they, um, so that they reflect what our block should be. Um, for this, we use the rfnot create verilog uh, Python script um, that, was, that is in um, the utils folder uh, in the UHD directory. And here we can call that script, giving it the path name for the block description file and the path to where that Verilog should be written. So by generating, uh, even if you're using the default um, block configuration, by going ahead and generating from the block YAML file, um, you, you, you actually you make sure that, um, that your block skeleton is exactly what you, what you expect it to be and there's no, uh, there's no extraneous uh, weirdness there in your, your various, um, as you go around the block. So we, we now have our Verilog files in, in, a, in a state that we think they should be in, and we can actually take our module at that point and put it down at the bottom of the block, uh, block Verilog file, the block name.v file. Now we can actually add some registers and ports. Um, inside of the Verilog file, um, before we overrode it, so apologies about that, uh, there was a really nice um, register implementation for um, this for a default register. There was a, there was a single register in there uh, with the address zero. And we can uh, create another register by, um, by obviously instantiating the hardware register and then setting these two parameters. Now for your address, you want to increment by four because the registers are 32 bits coming out. Uh, that's what comes across. And so we want to increment by four there. And then, um, we have a default value. Now, the uh, example code that's provided in the, in the Verilog file is actually really great. It uses case statements to do this, so you should uh, only have to go into each of the two or three case statements and make sure um, that behavior for your, new, for your uh, additional registers is, is mirrored there. So um, now we can move to the... the the uh, software side, and I will admit, I don't know everything about um, what these functions are doing, um, but this is, these, are the, these are the things we had to add for each new register and each new port to make them function. Um, so this is kind of a checklist. So there's a call to a register property for each register and port. There is a property object that you need and then for each additional port, there is a add property resolver. So uh, the, the, each block has a default uh, input port, output port, and register in there. So the, the, there is example code in there, and you just take that as your own and you know, change your parameters. Your port numbers have to be incremented, and your register numbers have to be incremented. Uh, so now we can do we can look at the GNU Radio in, uh, integration. Of course, we want to look at these in GNU Radio, get a nice um, block that we can use. So uh, this is where the dot block dot yaml uh, file comes in. Uh, so in that top section, we want to install our register callbacks. And uh, so uh, that's again, there's some example in the in the default uh, file there that you can follow right along with. And then we want to, we can customize the labels for each of our input and output. That way it's a little more helpful than in one, in two, out one, out uh, two. So we can make that look like uh, what we want. And for each of those inputs and outputs, the, the domain should be RFNOC and the data type should be uh, SC16, um, unless you're doing something really, really wild there. Um, Okay, so we, we've defined all of our parameters and we've got what we think is some, some good catalog. How do we define the image and uh, go and synthesize that? Well, um, 
So the block can be added to an image for synthesis, and we do that in the image core.yaml file. Um, the first thing that we'll run into, we'll discuss uh, is how do we actually connect that? So inside, um, th this, is, this is straight from the, the specification, so if you've been digging around in there, this will look familiar. Um, but there are three crossbars uh, in RFNOC. Uh, two of them are important for the data plane. So you have your static router, which at synthesis time connects the, all the blocks together. Uh, so if you connect two blocks inside of that static router, they can't be changed at runtime. Once they've been synthesized together that way and placed, on, placed in the image that way, um, they're always going to be connected. But if you want to change how your blocks are connected um, from between runs, then you're gonna wanna connect it up through that cheddar crossbar, which is a fully connected uh, performance crossbar. And to do that, we have to, we statically connect our block to these streaming endpoints. Well, um, that's probably what you're going to want to do most often. That's what uh, we wanted to do. And so uh, we can define streaming endpoints for uh, each additional block that we need to add to this image. Um, so we, for our endpoint, say endpoint one, uh, we don't have any control information, so we can leave that false. And then, but we do have data. And then we found, um, for, for my particular block, I didn't find that uh, the, the buffer size really, really had an impact on my performance. Or, so uh, we, just, we just left that as zero. Um, then we can define our knock blocks. So uh, I, I didn't want to give away how many living iterations of my FSS architecture I have. Uh, so I just went and used the gain example here. Um, uh, so here you see uh, the block description. You just pull in that block name.yaml file, and through the magic of uh, the mod tool and uh, all the make files, it knows exactly where to find that. And then importantly, here, here are our connections. So you see our uh, endpoint is being connected uh, to our gain block, and then our gain block to the endpoint. So that kind of completes the, the loop for getting data in and out of the, the, the block. And then again, very important, we come down here and we have our clock domains, and we want to connect our um, block to the CE clock. Um, you don't want to be running down random signals acting as your clock. Um, so for design synthesis, um, we can make a build directory from our, our module, and we can go in there and um, we can use CMake with, a, with the F directory to the UHD FPGA path. Uh, go through our standard uh, make incantations. And after we make install, this is when we should start, we should actually see the block in GNU Radio. Uh, so that kind of tells you if you're, you're on the right track and you can see what that looks like. Then the fun part, when we run this make with the image core name without the file extension, it will go ahead and, and make that image. Uh, this is your opportunity to, uh, um, you know, go get a snack while you make that image. Uh, we saw anything from 45 minutes to an hour and a half were pretty standard. And if we were doing, doing something really fun, like instantiating block RAM, it could be, you know, a day or something. Uh, so uh, lots, of, lots of fun with those types of uh, load times. So that creates a bit image, uh, a .bit file, um, which is located in this directory. Uh, so you can go uh, and your uh, XG or HG, that'll vary based on um, what type of image you, um, you created. So I have an XG image here because we're using dual uh, 10 gigabit ethernet. And then we can use our uh, image loader, uh, the image loader uh, command to, to get this onto your device. So you use your device arguments that you would usually use to connect and interact with your radio, and then you give it the path to that .bit file and uh, it will load that onto the radio for you. So uh, we, we have our FSS block and it's, it's running. So how did it perform? Well, our blocks kind of, um, the, the great thing about RF NOC is it, it, is it gives you this isolation against all the headaches that you would normally run into when developing on an FPGA. Um, but that also, how do you define your latency when you have um, uh, black boxes on either side of you? So we came up with a couple of our own metrics. Um, we first have this data latency metric, which tells us um, how many clock cycles between the receipt of the last sample happened before we transmitted that last sample to, um, to our recipient block. 
And then secondly, we have our product latency. How many samples did it take after we received the last sample for us to actually make, um, find the FSS results and send that along to, to the next block out of its port? So um, our data latency was um, one clock cycle. We never halted the stream. Uh, you know, uh, normal caveats apply that er, the recipient block down the chain didn't throw up a, uh, didn't deassert its uh, T ready flag. So this is assuming it's always ready to, to take on the stream information. But um, we never halted from our block, never halted the stream. And so it just came right through. And so we had a single data cycle of data latency. And then for product latency, um, we actually were able to um, take into account the last sample uh, of um, the data set in, that, in the clock cycle that it arrived. And so we really only had um, the time it took to transmit uh, the data. And so that was, um, so then to put the header on the bus and for it to be consumed and then to put our data products on the bus and for that to be consumed. And so that was three clock cycles. And we did successfully get this running at, at, the, at, the, at full bandwidth. We had this running out at 200 uh, mega samples per second. So we were, we were really happy with that performance. Uh, so here uh, we, we just kind of wanted to go through uh, a process that we found useful for developing our knock blocks, kind of a, a checklist of things that had to be touched and looked at to really get it, uh, really get it functioning. And we also, uh, I presented here a, a, just a fast spectrum sensing architecture, uh, and it was developed using this method, and then um, gave a quick performance analysis of that resulting spectrum sensing block. So we had a, a few references for FSS and all of the fun specifications. So thank you. All right, thank you, Riley. Um, are there any questions for Riley? All right, we do have a question, Aaron. Thank you, I'm wondering uh, what sort of pain points you ran into uh, in the process of creating your own RF knock block and uh, what we might have been able to do to ease that process. I, I think uh, really the, the the big hurdle was, um, I think once I found the generating the, the, the generate verilog.py script, once I found out that that was a, a available and, and easy to use, that was, uh, that was really helpful. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to add multiple ports. And uh, when, when the Python script, when I found that, most of that went away, except for the little bit uh, that had to be done in the implementation file, the implementation C file. Um, but really, it was just um, learning the interfaces and and figuring out what everything uh, everything was. There was there was a couple weeks at my desk with the the specification in my lap as I as I hacked away at Verilog. So, um, but uh, otherwise, it was just you know learning everything and figuring out where everything was. Thank you. 